Good morning. Please rise for the procession with the cross. Our opening hymn is hymn 525, Crown Him with Many Crowns, verses 1 through 4. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. James Lutheran Church of Imperial Beach. Glad that you have joined us today. Those at home, please send us an email and we'll send you the bulletin. Uh, also, you'll notice something a little bit different in the church. You might guess what Sunday we're uh, here today on. It's uh, Palm Sunday. And just a little note, uh, when you come up for communion, uh, you may not want to use the side aisles and when you come when you return, go back down the center aisles, and that will keep you from having to bushwhack as you're going down through to your, back to your seat. So, uh, Also, this will begin Holy Week, and I'll have it at the announcements too, but we'll have services on, we'll have a service on Thursday at 7, Friday at 7, 2 on Sunday, 8 a.m. out on the corner lot, Lord willing, it's not raining. And then 11 o'clock inside the church. In between, community breakfast. You're all invited. All the neighbors are invited. Please invite them to come. It's free. Free community breakfast. Uh, it's starting to come down. We'll begin with our invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. I have been forgotten like one who is dead. I have become like a broken vessel. But I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies, 
and from my persecutors. Make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. And at this you may be seated, or if you like, you may kneel. Almighty and eternal God, it was your will that your Son, Jesus Christ, should endure the pains of the cross in our place, to deliver us from the power of the devil, to grant us the remission of our sins, and by his resurrection to rescue us from everlasting death. Let us confess our sins, therefore, to our Heavenly Father. Forgive us, Father, for we have sinned, we poor sinners plead guilty before you of all sins. Our mouths, minds, and lives need your cleansing forgiveness. We have not let your love have its way with us, so our love for others has failed. There are those whom we have hurt and those whom we have failed to help. We are sorry for all this and ask for your grace and mercy, and we want to do better. Jesus came down to die in our place on the cross, and for his sake, he forgives us all our sins. In the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Almighty God, because you know that we of ourselves have no strength, and would fail if tempted beyond what we can bear, keep our hearts and minds from all evil thoughts, and defend our bodies from all harm and danger, that we may serve you and our neighbors faithfully, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. All. Amen. You may be seated, and we continue with our next hymn. Hymn 442, All Glory, Laud, and Honor, verses 1 through 3.
Good morning once again. Our first reading this morning is from the Old Testament, from the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 12. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he. Humble, mounted on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. This is the word of the Lord. Christ entered once for all into the holy places. He means by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Therefore, he is the mediator or a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Amen. Our second reading is from the New Testament, from St. Paul's letter to the Philippians, from chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. St. Paul writes us, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equity with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Sunday. Very good. Um, and also it's the Sunday that starts the whole week. So we're going to lead up to the day of Jesus Christ on Sunday. And then we have Jesus uh, riding on a donkey. So people were so excited to see Jesus. Some have heard about his miracles. Some have seen his miracles. Just the other Well, he's riding up into a whole bunch of the 
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel reading this morning is from St. John chapter 12, verses 20 through 23. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. Now among those who went up to the worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies and it bears much fruit, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Father, glorify my name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for you for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out, and I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So the crowd answered him, We have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? So is this the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, the light is among you, for you a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, and you may become sons of light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoke, spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes, and understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogues. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Now we'll confess our faith with the words of the night of the Apostles' Creed. And we begin, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit 
the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. You may, you may be seated. M441, Ride On, Ride On in Majesty. Dear friends in Christ, let's start with a little quiz. What, in your opinion, is the most Christ-like attitude to be found on earth? I think some of you would rush right away to love, and that's certainly not a bad choice. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love, say, says the scriptures. And you can see many examples of Christ's love, and we'll see it here in Holy Week when we see Christ at the cross. Now, others of you might say, well, patience. Jesus certainly had a lot of patience. You see that as he worked with his disciples and training them as they would take over the mission of, uh, well, as he said, I'll make you fishers of, of men. And he was certainly patient with them. Forgiveness. Yes, Jesus and his forgiveness for others. You see it especially there on the cross when he even forgives his enemies. Forgive them. They know not what they do. Another might say grace. Grace, that's a great one. Uh, we're blessed by God and we don't earn it at all. He, he does this for us. I think, wow, that is, that is really something. Uh, Christ is certainly full of grace. Grace, mercy, goodness. You could, you could list all these different attitudes. But I was thinking of Matthew 11. Matthew 11 if you had a red letter edition of the Bible, you would see this part in red letters, and those are the words uh, that Jesus himself spoke, if you're familiar with the red letter edition. And Jesus says this concerning himself. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see that in uh, verse 29? Gentle, gentleness, and lowliness of heart. That's what he says uh, concerning himself. He was interested in serving the needs of others. We have the idea here of servanthood. We'll see that as we have, as we call it, the Last Supper, and when he, before he starts 
Holy Communion with his disciples, he, he washed their feet. And so you see that humbleness and gentleness of heart. It's something that you often don't see in the world. Uh, just think about this. Greece said, be, uh, be wise, know yourself. Rome said, be strong, discipline yourself. Religion says, be good, conform yourself. Epicureanism says, be sensuous, enjoy yourself. Education says, be resourceful, expand yourself. Psychology says, be confident, assert yourself. Materialism says, be satisfied, please yourself. Pride says, be superior, promote yourself. Asceticism says, be lowly, suppress yourself. Humanism says, be capable, believe in yourself. Christ says, be a servant, humble yourself. It's enough to make us laugh in the day in which we live. How many models don't follow the Christ-like attitude? There are precious few. You can see all these other ones, Greece and Rome and psychology and all these. You, you've heard them before. But Christ gives us the attitude of what you might find in, well, that relationship between a mother and her child. When a child turns 18... The mother doesn't say, okay now, um, I gave you life, and I've raised you these past 18 years. Here is your bill. This is what you owe me. <laughs> the kid could never pay it. What can you pay for giving you life and, and raising you to be that great individual that you are, 18 years old? That's, that's the mother. That's kind of the servant. She's not been paid uh, nearly enough for all the that she's done. But then you say to yourself, well, how do I have that kind of attitude, this kind of Christ-like attitude in a world that's a dog-eat-dog -dog world? You know, the big dogs eat up the little dogs. How's this going to be? How do we do this? So you look at Christ, the person of Christ. Focus on him. Focus on the cross. What do we learn there? The hymn writer, Isaac Watts, he focused on Christ in this way. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet or, thro or thorns compose so rich a crown? Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century, mentioned him last week, French. A monk spoke uh, these words in sacred head now wounded. Sacred head now wounded with grief and shame weighed down. Now scornfully surrounded with thorns, thine only crown. O sacred head, what glory, what bliss till now was thine. Yet though despised and go gory, I joy to call thee mine. The focus is on Christ. And the focus on Christ attacks our, our pride. This is what we see here in our text today from Philippians. We're looking at Philippians today rather than maybe what we think of as the traditional text for uh, Palm Sunday. We had Palm Sunday at Advent. If you remember at the beginning of the season of the coming of Christ, because the liturgists understood long, long ago that this is the eventuality, that Christ was born into the world. If you remember, Advent prepares for Christ's birth, that Christ would be born, that he would give his life on the cross. Here at Philippians, we have the attitude of, of Christ. Uh, I want to add a couple extra verses from the beginning uh, that's not in our text. It says this, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, all of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. 
that is the uh, attitude that we see here in Philippians. Uh, that was not the attitude of the Roman Empire. When Paul came into Philippi, it was a Roman colony, a special Roman colony where many uh, former soldiers had uh, retired in that, uh, in that colony. And uh, it was a place, you know, of, given its past of discipline and pride and strength, yes, and also of brutality. So there's great concern for the people of Philippi at the church that had been started there was that they would have the same attitude that was in Christ Jesus. Now the paragraph that I just read, it ends with the word others, considering others, that they are uh, more important than you are. There's a story from the early days of, Sal of the Salvation Army. And uh, William Booth, who was the founder, he was going to be a speaker at one of their conventions, and he, he couldn't make it. And so at the last minute, he sent a telegram. That tells you how long ago it was. And it had one word on it, others, others. Taken here from Philippians, consider others. And so this idea of having others first, having unity is, uh, well, is being unselfish. And that was the attitude of Christ Jesus, his humility and lowliness of heart. Because disunity is usually the result of selfishness. And so the Apostle Paul wanted to warn against that. He gives four conditions that he applies here. He says, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy. Or he might put it this way. Since there's encouragement in Christ, be of the same mind. Since there's comfort in love, maintain that love. Since there's fellowship of the Spirit, be united around that Spirit. Since there's affection and sympathy, be intent on that purpose. Now, being of the same mind, does that mean that everything is uniform? That we have to have the same opinion about everything? The same personal convictions have to be the same, shared among every... No, it, it doesn't mean that. Uh, being unified does not mean being uniform. When you go into boot camp, they give you a uniform, and you will all have the same haircut, and you will all be told when to go to bed and when to get up and when you're going to eat and, all, and when you're going to march and all these kind of things. That's being uh, in uniform. Here he's talking about unity. It doesn't mean you have to dress alike and sound alike and do everything alike, but you're considerate of the others, seeing them as more important. Maintaining the unity among people. Harry Ironside, an, an old writer, an old commentator from some years back, he phrased it this way. It is very evident that Christians will never see eye to eye on all points. We are so largely influenced by habits, environment, education, the measure of intellectual and spiritual apprehension, that it is an impossibility to find any number of people who look at everything from the same standpoint. How then can such be of one mind? Well, the mind of Christ is the lowly mind. And if we are all of this mind, we shall walk together in love, considering one another and seeking rather to be helpers of one another's faith than challenging each other's convictions. That's the secret, the lowliness of mind, the Christ-like attitude, projecting uh, humility, the humility of Christ. <coughs> So if we look at these verses here, the extra ones that I, that I read there in Philippians, if you had your Bible and were looking there, it would say, first, never let selfishness or conceit be the motive. He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So never uh, do something out of selfishness. Second tip, uh, regard others as more important than yourself. That's what the scriptures teach. That's Jesus kneeling down and washing the feet of his disciples. And third, don't let your attention to your own personal interests uh, be first considered. You have to take care of yourself, that's true. But also looking out for your neighbor's interests and need. And 
And so I'm not talking about self-flagellation. Remember, that was the old practice of the monks in the, in the Middle Ages. They'd go in their cell and they'd beat themselves, trying to beat the sin out of themselves so they could get to heaven uh, quicker. Uh, no, it's not that. It's more the attitude. Um, I, I was thinking of a young couple that I, I married. This is some many years ago. And uh, the wife came back after a couple of years or so, and she said, uh, you know, my husband doesn't want to have any children. You know, and that really wasn't I had in mind. And I uh, said, okay, well, you know, if we want to talk, I'll be glad to talk. And so we sat down and talked together a little bit with her, her and her husband, and he said, well, okay, well, if we don't, practice any birth control for a little while. I'll see what happens, then maybe we'll see what happens. Well, you know what's going to happen. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so they had a child. And uh, he said, okay, we have a child. That, well, that's good. We, we have a child. Well, sometime later, uh, they had moved, but they came back and sometime they had two children. I said, oh, you have two children. And he goes, yeah, you know, I kind of like that first one. So <laughs> I thought we'd have two, you know, and... Uh, I said, okay, and he said, yeah, it's like, well, it's the alpha and the omega, the first and the last. And I said, oh, all right. Next thing I heard, well, they had three children. <laughs> he told me the, the, what was kind of holding him up is he said, you know, uh, when we got married, I was thinking, I like everything orderly. I like my closet, everything in order, the shoes laid out nicely and shine. I don't like sticky stuff on the kitchen floor. I like the house nice and neat and I knew kids were, oh, and stinky diapers. I want nothing. He said, well, I've gotten over all those things. Humility of heart, right? Looking out for the needs of others. Don't let selfishness or conceit be your motive. He said, you know, that was kind of my motive. I was a little bit selfish and self-centered. And you notice that I called them tips, but actually they're commands. They're not just pro-tips, as you hear. But it, these are commands from the, from the Lord. It's good to review them. It brings uh, unity. I think of uh, what Pastor Jones said of the Westminster Chapel just after World War II. It's not me, okay? I'm not that old. <laughs> but he was talking about how uh, after the war he, he made these comments. How often during that last war were we told of the extraordinary scenes in air raid shelters? How different people belonging to different classes there in the common need to shelter themselves from the bombs and deaths. I forgot all the differences between them and became one. This was because that in the common interest, they forgot the divisions and the distinctions. In periods of crisis and common need, all distractions were forgotten and we suddenly became united. That's World War II. I was thinking of something a little more recent, too. Remember 9-11 and the attack on New York? And I remember President Bush down there in the middle of the rubble with the fire chief. Remember that? He's got the blowhorn, and uh, he's, he's out giving the message. And we're all New Yorkers now. We're all in the country from California to Maine to, you know, North Dakota to right down the Key West. We're, we're all New Yorkers. We're all unified. We're all working together. It doesn't mean we're uniformed, but we are united in this purpose. And so you're willing to sacrifice it sometimes. You're willing to give up some of the niceties that makes you comfortable so that you can help someone else in their time of need. Uh, the Roman Empire at that time and the Philippi were maybe, you know, Paul was a, maybe a little bit concerned about you know, the, the discipline and all these kinds of things that were part of the mystique of, of the Roman soldier, uh, he's saying, now, being concerned for others. The, the humbleness that was represented by Jesus Christ. And then he gives some, he gives some things to, to explain the attitude of Christ here, where in verses 5 uh, through 11, after that little introduction, he gives the example of Christ here. And he says, have this attitude in yourselves. And so you have this transitional verse. Have this attitude. And he says, and here's 
how I'd like to illustrate it to you. Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. What does it mean to grasp equality with God? He doesn't need to grasp equality with God because he already is God. Like we say in the creed, God of God, very God of very God. He is God. He is in human flesh. But before he was born in Bethlehem, he was in heaven, the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's adored by the angels and the archangels and all the company of heaven, as we say. He lived in that glory. And he gave that up to be born of a virgin in a little town, little nowhere town, to bring us salvation and eternal life. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And then John goes on, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is theanthropic. That gives you a little big theological Greek word, theanthropic, theos for God, anthropos, you know, anthropology, man. He is the God-man. That is Jesus Christ. He doesn't need to grasp equality because he is equal with the Father and uh, need, no need to grasp at it. He's equal with the Father and um, something he doesn't need to grasp. You, you think, you know, trying to give another example here. Thinking about giving up something, he gave up all the glories of heaven. You think of someone who maybe they started a business, and they started from scratch. Or maybe as some people say, I started below scratch. And we just scratched our way and clawed our way, and we worked, and now it's a very prosperous business. But then, the, you know, the founder, he's getting older. And he realizes, yeah, I hate to realize it, but you know, I'm going to have to pass this along. I can't keep this forever. And it's hard for him to be able to do that because he's think of all the work he put into it, everything he did, and it's all prosperous. And is the next guy going to be able to do it? And, and uh, he gives up some of that glory. He's got to pass it along. And Jesus said he's in heaven and all that glory, and he comes, though willingly, he comes to... Uh, serve to serve us. He leaves all that glory. Think of Tom Landry. Remember him? He used to walk along the sidelines of the Dallas football games and always had that kind of stoic look in his little hat that he'd wear. Well, you know, one day he had to give up all the glory of being the coach of the Dallas Cowboys. And, uh, it, well, it wasn't very pleasant for him. You know, and his wife was asked afterwards, after a couple of years, How's he, how did he adjust to it? She said, well, yeah, he's adjusting to it. It was tough. Uh, and the way it worked out was, uh, well, he got his notice. After 29 years, he got his notice on a Friday and was told to have his desk cleaned out on a Sunday. He was gone. Yep, just like that. And so you leave all that glory and you come out into reg regular society. Jesus emptied himself, all the glory of heaven. He remains God, but he now does not use the prerogatives of being God. He's going to live like one of us in every way. From the time of being a little child, to being an adult, and being abused by, uh, you know, the leadership of his people and uh, giving his life for us. He says, by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, he humbled himself to the point of death. And on top of that, death on the cross. You know, a very horrible kind of death. Not just a quick heart attack and he dropped over, but uh, being tortured to death. It was costly. Ministry sometimes is costly. The things that you do sometimes in serving the Lord can be costly. If it's not costly, it probably won't accomplish too much. And so sometimes it takes a cost and to, to do the things that the Lord would have us do. And so Jesus, he, he took the cost, humbled himself, born of a woman, and willing to live this life and to die in our place. Whoever exalts himself, the scriptures say, will be humbled. And whoever humbles himself will be exalted, says Jesus. The second part of the 
interest here is, uh, you know, then Jesus, he goes to the cross. He leaves behind 11 disillusioned men. Yeah, he had one who was so disillusioned, he killed himself. There's 11 left. And then the Lord stepped in once again. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name is above every name. Bestowed on him the name above every name, Lord Jesus Christ. Every knee bow and every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ, as the disciples will learn, will be raised from the dead. They will see him ascend to heaven. He will go to heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, as we say in the creed. And from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Every knee will bow. Today is the day to, to learn to bow to Jesus. Don't wait till you come and you've resisted him and then he makes you bow. But make it such that you trust in Jesus Christ today, the humble one, the one who gave his life for you. And when he comes, you will fall on your knees and praise him and thank him, the exalted son of God who came and humbled himself on your behalf. Micah wrote this, one of the Old Testament prophets. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. Kindness and justice and walk humbly with God. And so the Christian, knowing his sins are forgiven, knowing Christ and following him, following his example, is a sample of unselfishness, of humility, looking out for others, holding others up more highly than yourself. And may the peace of Christ, our exalted one, keep your hearts and minds in him to everlasting life. the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings, we'll sing hymn 547, The Lamb.
thank you for the blessings that you give us every day of our lives. In the name of your loving son, Jesus Christ, we pray. And we have our announcements. And here's Jane. Thank you, Pastor. Um, we began this morning, or Pastor began this morning, telling us about Holy Week, and I'm just here to expand on it. Firstly, all the times Teresa have got in the, in the bulletin, um, you will be getting a flyer which will be attached to all the next, or the, the, the upcoming bulletins. Um, that little flyer is the same as is in the newspaper, and there's piles of them at the back. So either take a photograph of this, Faye will have it on Facebook, Teresa will send it out. You can attach it to text messages, you can Facebook it yourself, or email it to friends and family. Next Sunday, it is all about community and community breakfasts. Um, for those that are new, we have a huge community breakfast. Everybody, please, if you've got family in town, Expect to bring them. We'll have a pancake breakfast here with frittata and sausage and orange juice and the whole schmoo. Um, we are not going to be having sunrise service at the beach this year. After a lot of discussion, we've decided to have it on our beautiful corner, which Steve has been keeping beautiful. Um, it will still be at 8 o'clock, sunrise service. We're not allowed to do it any earlier. Um, then, who's ever there, please come on in and bring your family to breakfast, or you can come to breakfast first and then come to our 11 o'clock service. Um, now, where you guys come in, sorry, I need your help for a lot of things. Um, we will be watching the weather, incidentally, um, because if there is a storm, any sign of it raining on Sunday, the 8 o'clock service will be brought in here. However, we need to stage things on Saturday. So anybody that can give up some time on Saturday, 9 o'clock we'll start out here, and we get everything ready from the chairs, the tables that we use out there, the linens, and we assemble them ready to go out first thing on Sunday morning. Sunday morning... We do not have to be here until 7 o'clock. We used to be here at about 6 to 6.30 to get down to the pier. Now, whoever can give a hand, please turn up at 7 o'clock. Mike will be here, and we'll be getting everything pushed out and put on the, um, on the corner. Um, Matt and Beth will need help as well. They, they take the whole sound system out. So if you're interested in that, hook up with them. They'll tell you when they need you. Um, LWML will be decorating the fellowship hall, so hook up with any of the LWML ladies. Joyce is here today. Um, I see Sandy's here. Just find out where you can help, and please offer your help to them. Um, breakfast serving, we've already got most of the servers, but I do need a cleanup crew. So if you could possibly help clean up, maybe it'll take an hour from about 10.30 to 11.30 on the, um, the Sunday morning. Um, and then one last thing, after we have service on the, on the corner, who's ever here, we need the chairs brought back to the fellowship hall before we start breakfast. I don't want half of them back, I want them all brought back so that we all sit down together and have a big community breakfast. Um, and I think that's it. It is on Facebook and it will be in the Eagle Times. Please pick up at Eagle Times at the back. Did I cover everything? Yeah. Thank you. Fred? Oh, oh, Jerry. Jerry yeah, good morning. Uh, yeah, I'm Jerry. And uh, I just want to thank everybody for the Easter egg hunt. Boy, that was amazing. I, I, I'm so grateful to be a part of, you know, the church because everybody from just stuffing, uh, thank you so much. We had like 6,000 uh, eggs stuffed. Uh, we had, sheesh, I don't know how many kids, but a lot of kids and it was just so wonderful because then it rained afterwards. You know, it cleaned everything up. Wow. It was, uh, I, I thank you. And, you know, Beth and, and uh, Matt, they're amazing just, you know, with the sound system. And Matt counted down and make sure the kids, you know, went all at once. So uh, I thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Yep. It was a beautiful day. Thank you. Yeah, some of, some of this is a repeat, but uh, not this week, but the week from Tuesday, the call committee is going to meet with Dr. Gibson. We have some questions. It's basically an orientation. So 
and that's going to help us move forward. And then there will be a survey, and then there will be the opportunity for you to, have a, if you have a candidate you want to put in the pot that we send to uh, Dr. Gibson. But all those things, they, they recommend to just go through the orientation first and then go from there. So I just want to keep everybody up to date that we are being proactive. All right. Okay. Thank you, Fred. And Mark? I'm only going to tell you this because Pastor's speech this morning, his sermon this morning. How many people were at the Easter egg hunt yesterday? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Less than half. The same. Yesterday, I was there kind of being a police officer, keeping kids or keeping people away from the eggs until it started. But then they started picking up their eggs. And I'm walking around picking up the ones that were broken. And Staying with Pastor's sermon this morning, this little boy, he comes over, he's got a little bucket, got five or six golden eggs in it. And he and this little girl who didn't have any saw a golden egg at the same time, but he was closer, so he reached out and grabbed it, meaning he had at least a half a dozen, she had none. The little boy took one look at her with disappointment on her face and ran over and gave it to her. Nobody prompted him. He didn't have to. He could have kept it himself. And I'm standing there thinking, if only adults could behave like that. That's compassion. That's love. So Pastor Sermon is 100% right. Uh, we see it every day of our lives. It's unfortunately we don't see it often enough. Thank you. Oh, and remember, the best way to grow your faith is to share your faith. Okay. Thank, you. thank you, Mark. And thank you to all those who had the Lenten dinners. They were great. We had the number. We just had wonderful meals uh, throughout the Wednesday night services. No Wednesday night this week. So we will have Thursday for the Holy Thursday, or you might call it Monday Thursday service at 7 o'clock, and then 7 o'clock on Friday for the Good Friday service, and then on Sunday we've heard that 8 and 11. And Sandy? No dinners, right. No dinners on Thursday or Friday either. Thank you for reminding me to say that. Now, I have the wonderful opportunity to have Ileana and Zachary to come up. If you would bring your hymnals with you. They finished the catechism class, and uh, we're going to have a little confirmation for them. <laughs> If you want to follow along, it's on page 272 for the confirmation, 272. All right, come right on up. This is where they turn around and sing a solo. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm just, I'm kidding. Okay, so 272. So here we are. Beloved in the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ said to his apostles, All authority in heaven has been given to, in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You have been baptized and catechized in the Christian faith according to our Lord's bidding. Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Lift up your hearts, therefore, to the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. <coughs> Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge the gifts that God gave you in your baptism? Yes, yes I, do. I do. You renounce the devil. Yes, I renounce him. You renounce all his works. Yes, I renounce him. You renounce all his ways. Yes, I renounce him. Do you believe in God the Father Almighty? Yes, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? I do. Do you confess the doctrine of the Evangelical Lutheran Church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from the small catechism to be faithful and true? I do. Do you intend to hear the word of God, receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word, and deed? Remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? I do by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the confession and church and to suffer all, even death, rather than fall away from it? I do by the grace of God. We rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized, have received the teaching of the Lord. You have confessed the faith and been absolved of your sins as you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament. He who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Eliana, the almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and the spirit has forgiven you all your sins, strengthened you with his grace, the life everlasting. Amen. Zachary, uh, the almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you this new birth of water and spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthened you with his grace, the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness, bringing these, your, your son and daughter, to the knowledge of your son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling them both with the heart to believe and with the mouth to confess his saving name. Grant that bringing forth the fruits of faith, they may continue steadfast and victorious to the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the, cross of right, the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty and most merciful Father, in the waters of holy baptism, you have united your children in the suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, cleansing them by his blood. Renew in them the gift of your Holy Spirit, that they may live in daily contrition and repentance, with a faith that ever clings to their Savior. Deliver them from the power of Satan and preserve them from false and dangerous doctrines that they may remain faithful in hearing Christ's word and receiving his body and blood. By the Lord's Supper, strengthen them to believe that no one can make satisfaction for sin but Christ alone. Enable them to find joy and comfort only in him, learning from this sacrament to love you and their neighbor and to bear their cross with patience and joy until the day of the resurrection of their bodies to life immortal. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. La paz de Cristo. Now let's give him a big St. James welcome. Now rise for prayer. And we pray, Lord God, our Heavenly Father, your Son humbled himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Fix our faith upon his death for our salvation. Enrich the proclamation of the gospel and enliven our hearts to live out this faith until Christ comes again in glory. Preserve the church and the preaching of your word against all enemies. Bless our homes that parents and children may serve one another, faithfully and grow in instruction and faith until life's end. Give health and wisdom to all who serve in public office that their authority may be exercised for the benefit of our people. 
Renew our lives with your forgiveness that we may learn not to dig up old scores, but rather to live by forgiveness with faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Teach us to be slow to judge, quick to forgive, and steadfast in love for you and for one another. Also, merciful Lord, you have shown great compassion to us. Teach us to show such compassion to others and to be attentive to those new to the faith or vulnerable to temptation. And gracious Lord, bless those now training to be pastors and church workers. Grant to all the baptized and aid all your aid of your Holy Spirit so that receiving your gospel with joy, we may share it freely with those outside the household of faith. Bring an end to the threats of terror and violence among all peoples and open all nations to the voice of your word through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for the important work of the Inner Lutheran Emergency Relief Team as it helps our neighbors in a time of disaster. Bless volunteers who are pitching in to renovate and restore the homes that have suffered from the flooding and bless the resources that they would be enough to supply the needs of those who have suffered these losses. May those efforts be a strong Christian witness to your, of your love in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We pray, too, for the families of Norma Cupola, Marina Sanchez, and Vesta Carot. We pray also for Jorge, for Richard and Jerry, Alyssa and Grayson, Patty, Jay, Carmen, Zach Kelly, and Leo, for Jeff, Ann, Carl, and uh, May and Shiloh, for Peter and Joan, Jill, Melissa, John, Isaiah, Sandy, Vicki, and Kurt. Diane, Noah, Kim, Michael, Irma, Carl, Tony, and Joaquin. For Shona, Heidi, Josie, Dominic, Judith, Mark, Mike, Joel, Carl, and Donna, Nancy, Daniel, Maddie, and Zoe, Edie, Joy, Jim, and Quinn, Patsy, Maria, Bill, Luca, Doug, and Joanna, Matt, Dewey. For Daniel, Ruth, and Eliana, Lisa, John, and Bonnie, Tim, and Vicki, and Dorothy. Lord Jesus, we intercede in your name for the sick, walk with them in their pain and uncertainty. In your compassion and perfect wisdom, bring healing to their body, mind, and spirit. Use us to encourage, comfort, and strengthen them in your healing name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Lord, we also pray for Joy Larson, Bill Keyes, J.D. Zabel, and Vicki Goyne, whose birthdays are this week. May your children also remember the new birth given through the holy baptism. Grant health and all spiritual blessings throughout the coming year. Graciously and bless and keep your servants always in your loving care. Amen. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We praise you, Father, that you have sent your Son, not in wrath but in mercy. And as we enter this most holy week and ponder together the mysteries of your great salvation, Show us the answer to your people's prayers of Hosanna and the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord <coughs> lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. On the tree of the cross you gave salvation.